So let's get more concrete about histograms. The task is the same as in the video before. So we have a frequency distribution, a real one. This is what the database table tells us, how many um, occurrences we have for the individual attributes. So on the x-axis here you have the different values, the attributes. Let's say in the previous example it was 1, 2 and so on until 20. And here you have the frequency of occurrence of these values. So now in this slide you see two ways how to create a histogram. The first one is also what I have drawn already in the previous video. So you're creating groups of equal width. So you're putting the same number of elements from the domain into one group. I have illustrated this for putting 10 values into the same group. So you have one big bucket from 1 to 10 and one from 11 to 20. Or you have four, for instance here, uh, buckets. Each has a width of five. And then inside these, inside these um, buckets, you're considering the sum or the average of these frequency values. Alternative way to do this is the so-called equidept histogram. There you're creating buckets that have the same depth or height. So they always contain the same number of elements. So it looks like this. In order to achieve this, you have to play around or adapt the width of the histogram. That means here, the width of the histogram buckets, this doesn't have to be fixed like for the equi-width histogram, but here you can change it. You see this one here is larger than the other ones, and this one here is larger than this one. Um, and you're doing this in order to um, put the same number of elements in each of the buckets. So it will have the same height, right? So here are some sample histograms of the type equi-width. So you see here with 2, 4, 5, and 10. And it's pretty easy to see how they are created. It's nice to see also the steps from 2 to 4. And then you see that these two buckets here will be merged into this one. And the neighboring 2 and 3 will be merged into this. And don't be confused on the x-axis here. I just enumerated the histogram cell ID. So from 0 to 9 or 0 to 4, if we have here in this case uh, five histograms, so it's not anymore like previously the ex, um, the real values on the x-axis here. But I guess you have all seen this already in one or the other course. The equidept histograms are a bit more unusual, but they have some big benefit over equi-width histograms because they can adapt better to um, spiky or to weird value distributions. So if you have a value distribution which looks like this. So there's a lot of things going on here. But then in the end, it's pretty much uh, uniformly distributed. And you give yourself, let's say, um, four histogram cells. Let's now try this for equi-width. So you have like this, one, two, three, four, right? So basically these other, these two here on the end, they are very boring, right? And they're only reporting on pretty much uh, uniform distribution. You don't have to waste effort to um, to report on these. Uh, one would be enough here, right? Because anyway, it's pretty much uniform. And now you can, of course, say and it's not only four. And in the toy example, there could, could be very many um, histogram cells. And the ones here in the end, they're pretty much wasting only storage of these values. But here in the beginning, in the front, you see a lot of things going on, right? The high um, variance of the data. But what do you do here? You're putting stuff which, which has a high variance into, into the same groups. Here, for instance, the first one. So this does not allow you to distinguish between something that appearing very uh, less frequently and something which is highly frequent. It would be much better to somehow make the resolution of the histogram finer in the first steps and then larger for the steps where nothing or not so much happens anymore. And the way we're constructing equidest histograms is doing this by adapting dynamically the width, so the position or the, the ranges on here on the x-axis while keeping the height of the histogram cells the same way. Here you see 
it's uh, of course a boring visualization because the histogram cells are always the same height. But here you see uh, for depths equal 10% and we have 120 values in total. 10% um, means that every, of, uh, every cell contains 12 elements. So we all have, they all have 12 elements and for depth equal 20% we have 24 elements within each of these cells. And now you see here um, for the two histograms, for the case for 10 and for 20, here you see the boundaries with respect to the rightmost data point within one, within one cell. And if you go going back now to the plot that we have seen with this one, two, three, until 20 and the real data, you just go over that and see how you can construct these equidets histograms. What you're doing basically is you're just starting here from the smallest value and you're trying to create batches of 12 values each. And then you um, see if the batch is full in which of these positions you are currently in. And this is also then the cell boundary, right? So if you have six, I don't remember the exact numbers from before, but if you have six here and zero here and 19 here, this means that you take, well, there's nothing to take, right? But then you take all of these six um, values with, with value two, or for, for attribute value two, the six occurrences, and this, does, this, of course, does not make the um, bucket full because you have a depth of 10%, which means 12. And then you have to get six more from these 19 occurrences for the value three, it would be. Oh, this was wrong. Three and four. So you have six values of um, six occurrences of value two. And then you take six more of value three. This makes up your 12 that you need for the first bucket. And then you, you're still within this, um, uh, the value three. So then you're noting down three is the, is the um, boundary of the cell. And then you're making the next batch. You have still 19 minus six values remaining, which is 13. And that's good enough to make the next batch of 12 values. And then you're getting, um, again, you're still within here this uh, 19 values of three. So it's still again three. And then you're continuing and you're trying to assemble more of these um, buckets of size 12. There's still one remaining here you take in and then you continue accumulating from the next cells or from the next um, values for four and five. And if you do this for the data that we have uh, previously seen, then you will see that then you're getting five will, will be the boundary for the next batch of 12 and then 12 and so on. And the same of course goes works like this, um, creating batches of 24. Now, once we have created histogram, you also want to use it. And querying histogram is fortunately very simple, particularly for the equi-width histogram. So we have to decide for like a point query, first of all, in which bucket or in which buckets does this value fall? And then if in the case of the equi-width histogram, we will take just the height of the bucket, if it's the absolute frequency, and divide it by the, uh, the width of this bucket. That means we assume that all the values within a bucket are uh, appearing the same amount of time. So we make a uniformity assumption. For equi depth histograms, it's a little bit more complicated because as we have seen in the previous examples, like a value can fall in multiple buckets if a value ha happens very often. So we have to consider this and then sum up, of course, these buckets and buckets which are shared with other values have to be again taken into consideration the ratio of the frequency occurrences within the bucket. Yeah. For range queries, it's a little bit more complicated, but also not very complicated. So if you have a histogram, multiple buckets, and you have a query, let's say, A strictly larger than 10, and then you see, okay, we need 11, 12, and so on. So where does 11 fall into? Let's say it falls here, 11. So we know already that this histogram bucket and this and this and all the others following have to be considered. So we have to sum up the frequencies of these. And here, just as for the case for the point query, we have to take only a part of the frequency 
mass from this histogram bucket. In this case, we would take all the numbers starting from 11 above and disregard the ones which are smaller than 11, so 10, 9, and so on, right? So we would take only a part of it. Again, for equivalent histograms, it's, it might be more obvious how to do this, but in principle, it's the same thing for the equidepth histogram as well. We always have to consider the buckets which are larger entirely for this query, a larger than 10, and then have to be a bit more careful when it comes to taking only a part of the bucket, which is shared also with other values. Sometimes, and I want to mention this briefly, sometimes histograms are not built over the distribution, but over the cumulative distribution, but then this is the same idea. So if you have a range query, then, then it's even easier. So you have a cumulative distribution histogram, or not very pretty, let's say we do it like this. So cumulative means we sum up all of the frequencies and then in the end we have a, like this shape of a distribution and then we can just right away go and answer range queries. And even in between queries as well, not only bigger or smaller than also between two values. Another note I should make about point queries, if you have point queries and you're talking about continuous domain, then you cannot do this. You have to instead go for queries on intervals because uh, it's a similar, uh, well, same problem as for density uh, functions for distributions. You cannot say how often or what is the probability you have a certain value if the random variable is continuous. So you would go for the cumulative distribution. In this case, this means for us here, we can query only for intervals or for ranges and not for specific points. For the discrete domain, however, we can also query, as in the previous example, for points or point queries. So if we now um, build the histogram, and let's say we have access to the true distribution, just um, by for the sake of checking how good the histogram is, let's say we take a database table, we build a histogram to see if the number of buckets is enough. So we do it for one attribute, let's say, and then we see how good it works. So how does it, what does it mean to say a histogram is good or not? So if you have a certain, let's say point query, or in general, just an estimate you want to obtain, estimate is usually expressed by this syntax, x hat, and x is denoting the value that uh, would be the exact value, so the exact frequency of a point or a range, and x hat is the estimate. And then we can take the absolute difference between the two and call it absolute error. Or we can take the ratio between the error, the absolute error, and the true value x and call this relative error. If we do this for multiple observations, we can take the sum of the squared error or the mean absolute error or the mean squared error. And these are all ways how to say that one histogram gives you perhaps better or worse estimates for multiple of these queries than another histogram. We will see later on when we talk about optimal histograms, we come back to this sum squared error notation because these histograms we will see later on, they are the optimal histograms regarding sum squared error. <laughs>